So you see, when the spiritual master gives an instruction like that, it can actually, it can make your whole life. Okay, any more? Yes, Peter has a question. At what point in your spiritual life did you have a first real taste of love of God? Oh, there's no question about that. That was with Vishnu John Swami. Mm -hmm. Being on Vishnu John Swami's uh, kirtan party. And um, sometimes we would do kirtan for six hours straight. Oh, man. Six hours straight, no breaks. Given it 120%. Just yeah, just pedal to the metal. <laughs> you know? And, and it was, and not just little, little soft kirtan either, like, yeah, totally, yeah, how do you go? You know, like jumping up and down. I mean, he was just amazing the way he would, you know, get so enthusiastic about chanting the holy name. And so the first ecstatic symptoms that I ever personally witnessed were uh, his. And of course, just the general atmosphere of beauty and love that he created with his chanting and his deity worship and his preaching. So I would have to say, uh, yeah, it was Vishnu John. So that's, there are no more questions. No more questions. Okay. Oh, there's another one. Get out the razors. <laughs> <laughs> um, Peter asks, so developing this love of God is Godhead is exponential growth or does it develop slowly over an extended period of time? Well, exponential growth develops slowly over a period of time. <laughs> See, you don't understand exponential growth. The exponential part doesn't become obvious until it hits the the, the elbow of the curve. Uh -huh. Then you know it's exponential because it starts to go up very quickly. It's almost like a discontinuous curve. Uh, but in the, in the formative stages of exponential growth, it increases very, very gradually, almost imperceptibly. Then when it gets to a certain point, it just takes off, zoom. So there's really no way to tell that something is growing exponentially until it reaches the point where it takes off like that. Uh, that's how we know it's an exponential curve and not just a, similar, a, a simple straight line curve. Love of Godhead has to be nourished and cultivated very carefully over a long period of time to actually reach the result. And the reason for that is that we are so conditioned by material consciousness. It takes a long time to overcome that material consciousness. But once we overcome it, then the growth is very fast. And of course, the danger at that point is that we commit some very serious offense and then fall down just as quickly. We've seen that happen too. Uh, so, the answer is that it's exponential and it's slow. <laughs> Any more? Um, oh yes. uh, uh, um, when you chanted 64 rounds, how long did it take to stop committing offenses? Oh boy. That's really hard to say. Because it doesn't just happen like that, it happens gradually. Um, actually, it took six, the whole six months. It took right up to the right up to the time when Krishna appeared. The last two or three days was very intense. And basically, he was rooting out all of the 
the very subtle emotional offenses, you know, by seeking love from other people and like that. Um, I mean, this is actually offensive in the sense that we should seek love from Krishna first. Huh? But in, in material consciousness, we try to get love from all these other people. And of course, it's a disaster. <laughs> so, um, if we go uh, to other people instead of Krishna, then of course he's offended by this because he loves us more than anybody else. You know? So naturally he feels like, why, are they, why is he going to this other person? So uh, that's that was the last thing to go uh, with me, you know, and um, I suppose it's that way with other people, but I don't really know. I, I have a suspicion everybody's different. Everybody's got a a different uh, ultimate Maya <laughs> that they have to that they have to overcome. But in any case, the secret is chanting basically 24 hours a day, uh, non-stop, as much as possible. And uh, coming to that place where all of our attention is concentrated on the Holy Name. And that just takes constant chanting, day in and day out, for weeks or months at a stretch. I don't know any other way to do it. And according to scripture, that's, that's really the only way to achieve offenseless chanting just by saturating the mind with the whole name. So Krishna Bhakti has another question. Uh -huh. um, how is it that the ISKCON gurus are getting up to so much nonsense that goes against Vedanta? So how is, how is it they can keep their disciples in so much ignorance? Is it the quality of people are unable to see the writing on the wall, the facts according to Vedanta? I guess keeping devotees engaged in collecting funds is one way of reducing their study time. Yeah, yeah. They they don't encourage studying the books. They they just encourage fundraising. And now the new uh, corporate style in ISKCON is uh, you know to encourage the um, congregational development among the Indian community. And uh, of course, those people don't have time to study because they're too busy working and maintaining a household. So basically they, they don't want people to study the books too much. Uh, study a little bit, enough to get faith. But not so much that you start asking questions. <laughs> and, uh, you know, actually there's nothing I find more uh, interesting than a good philosophical discussion. You've heard, if you've been listening to any of the evening darshans, you've heard we've had some really good discussions about the philosophy and about different areas of life and such that are connected with our philosophy. So uh, I don't know what these guys, you know, I don't know what their problem is. I, I, it's like I can't relate to it at all. It's such a foreign mentality to me because I find this philosophy is really interesting. You know, and of course there are things that I don't know, even though I've probably read Prabhupada's books as much as or more than anybody I know. Uh, there's still things that I don't know, and I'm constantly surprised when I'm doing research uh, for Vedanta Sutra, how much is in Prabhupada's books. I mean, it's just an ocean that, that nobody, no one person can know completely because we're not on that same platform as Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada, remember, is Nitya Siddha. He's an eternal associate of the Lord. And so when he came to this world, he was already liberated. He was already enlightened. That's how come he could like manage a whole Rathiatra festival in his neighborhood at age five years old. Huh? These symptoms are of an eternally liberated soul. So we want to try to follow in Srila Prabhupada's footsteps, but we also know that we're not the same quality as, as he is. And if we try to assume the same kind of exalted position, we'll just fall down because it's phony. Huh? So I try to be honest with my disciples and students that 
I don't really know everything, and I'm certainly not a great manager and a great leader like Srila Prabhupada. I don't have those personal qualities. You know, I know what I know, and I can do whatever I can do. But I'm certainly, uh, you know, very, very small compared with Srila Prabhupada. That's all right. I can still engage whatever abilities and strength I've got in spreading this message. And that is going to help as many people as want to take it up. We're on the internet, so everybody can get this information, and they can become self-realized, and they can teach too. We encourage that. We're not trying to hold people back. In fact, our whole strategy, or our whole intention, is how to encourage people to that they can also preach. They can also start teaching this knowledge. Well, we want that. Huh? And um, that 